Okay, good afternoon, um, and thank you for giving me the chance to speak in the beautifully refurbished McEwen Hall, where I graduated far too many years ago. Um, I've come to talk, my name's Alison Clapp, I'm a, an e-learning lecturer in Newcastle University Medical School, and I've come to talk about this study which is currently running. Um, it's a long-winded way of saying, uh, what are we doing in the university with technology-enhanced learning? Um, and where should we, we be putting our training and stopping barriers and um, problems with its use for the future? Um, this study's come out of uh, the university's strategy for increasing blended learning for their students. Um, to do that, we need to know uh, what, what's happening now. How are staff using technology in their teaching? What are students using? And what do they think about it? We've also found, uh, we, we've been looking at the barriers to the actual use of, of technology enhanced learning and what helps people use it. And all this is, is uh, aimed towards providing future training for both staff and students. Our study is a mixed methods um, explore, sequential exploratory study and it covers all the campuses of Newcastle University. So that's Newcastle, London, Singapore and NewMed which is Newcastle University Medicine in Malaysia. And we have been running focus groups uh, for both staff and students, in theory, in all campuses, but unfortunately London didn't supply anyone for their focus groups. Um, but from these, these qualitative uh, focus groups, we have thematically analyzed the transcripts. And from that, we've come up with a questionnaire that's as far as we've got at the moment, but this, this questionnaire will be used as a, a quantitative study um, sent out to all staff and students this September. Um, and hopefully that will, will give us further barriers and facilitators um, identified for, for our future planning. We've already, from the focus groups, um, made quite a lot of... Uh, advancement in our knowledge of what people use. Uh, for a start, and hardly surprisingly, everyone expects to use technology. And uh, as you see a quote from one of the staff, it's part of standard teaching practice. And there's a huge range of technology types um, that are widely integrated into the learning and teaching. Uh, there are barriers, and I'm sure it's the same in every single higher, in, higher education institution in Britain, that time is a problem. Um, time to actually create uh, technology-enhanced learning and also time for training to do this. Training can be a problem that it might not actually be available. We've found that students are incredibly confident in their own use of uh, technology, but actually this quite often is misplaced. Um, some staff complain that students can't do some basic things with Word, Excel. We found that there's a few differences uh, between the cultures and campuses. Now, in, in the UK, Quite often staff train themselves, whereas in the, in the eastern campuses, um, staff prefer somebody to do that for them. So although they use very similar technologies, they are expecting more training. There's been a very wide range of uptake, as predicted by the diffusion of innovations theory, um, which I'll come on to next. This is a very old chestnut. It was uh, coined by Tarde in 1903, and it, it's actually describing the behavioral psychology of the uptake of an innovation. And the innovation doesn't have to be technology. 
Um, for instance, it can be changes in health behaviours following a public health campaign. But uh, Sahin, in 2006, described the, the diffusion of innovations model as being the most appropriate for investigating the uptake of technology in higher education. Rogers sort of um, developed the diffusion of innovations from Tarde's model in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, it's defined as the process in which an innovation is communicated through certain channels over time in a social system. Well, the innovation is anything that's perceived as new. And in our case, for some of the staff, that's blended learning. And in our case, the, the social system is the entire university. The innovation decision process consists of, of having a knowledge of the innovation, thinking about it and being persuaded it'll work, making a decision to use it, and then using it and confirming that it's OK, and they'll use it again, or rejecting it. And some people will go through this process much faster than others. It, the, the rate of, of uh, take up of the innovation, in other words, the slope of the curve, gets steeper the, the faster it, it is diffused. And whether somebody takes up the innovation, it depends on their, their perceived, the perceived characteristics of the innovation and their previous beliefs and experiences. So if you've had a bad experience with technology and somebody says, use this, you might not want to. There's different adopter character categories of, of innovations. You have the innovators who really are ahead of the curve. They're not worried about uncertainty, the, the will it work. Um, they're, they're very experimental. And you have early adopters who are also quite ahead of the curve. And they tend to be the opinion leaders, the ones that uh, the rest of the world look to for advice. The early majority of people that are quite happy to use an innovation once some of the uncertainty has been taken away from it. And the late majority are those who would really rather not use it, but have to because of peer pressure. And we have the laggards, which sounds sort of, you know, we're being rude about the laggards. Quite often they don't use the innovation because actually it doesn't suit their purposes at all. But they do tend to be quite traditional and distrust um, the, the innovations themselves and the change agents who try and bring about their use. Well, why is this relevant to the rollout of, of blended learning or any technology enhanced learning in an institution? Um, it depends on your communication routes. New technologies are um, being communicated by interpersonal networks will be taken up much faster across an institution than if, if they're in silos and you need opinion leaders to spread the word. The change agents tend to be the learning technologists or people like myself who, who have a pedagogical interest in technology. Um, so they should be targeting, or we should be targeting, the opinion leaders and helping the opinion leaders spread the, the news of the use of these technologies through interpersonal networks. So, from our data, the results of our qualitative study, staff and students have a huge range of innovation adopter cat categories. And depending on what adopter category you're in, you have different barriers and facilitators to the use of, of technology. Um, this quote is, is from a member of staff showing that we do have a huge range of adopter categories. Um, the, the complete rejection of, of technology is incredibly rare. Students really enjoy an innovator's approach to, to learning. Uh, one, of, one of the quotes from Newcastle students was, 
He'll create these videos beforehand and then plays them in the lecture, and they're really good. He'll get 3D models of anatomy on the screen. But we have some quite ageist comments from students as well, which really puts me in my place. But there are younger lecturers who can use the technology better, and they're the ones that are likely to use these anatomy things or on beer, whereas some of the older ones won't necessarily do that. In, in Numed, in Malaysia, um, the staff, like the ones in Newcastle, think that uh, using technology is part of what we do in our roles. So we're all probably continuously looking for what else it is we could be doing. What's new? What's different? The staff in NUMED also recognize the need for good training. And, and they're quite happy to have champions. Um, someone said, you, you, in the institution, you've got to have some people who are enthusiastic enough or tech savvy enough and good enough teachers to be able to teach the teachers. The new med students, though, complain of tokenism for technology enhanced learning in their teaching. Uh, there was a comment on lecture voting systems. It feels like a bit forced in and kind of, well, the content with it, because it's not the first step in terms of teaching you, because the teaching method is still very much traditional. Students over in, in Malaysia are quite happy to use OneNote things like Khan Academy videos, and none of these have been actually signposted by the university. The foundation students in Malaysia, they, unlike the South African students of this morning, they practically asked for blended learning because they thought they learned better in this mode. So students are very switched on about this. Our Singapore staff, it's a very small community in Singapore. And they said, so in terms of technology, we share with each other and we help each other out. Though, if you have a smaller family, you're going to get a smaller rate of diffusion of innovations because the interpersonal networks are not wide enough. As I've said, barriers have been time. And you can see some of the quotes from the staff for time for training. We need to narrow the gap between teachers and learning technologists. And also reward. Very often, people get their promotion from their research, not from their teaching. And uh, perhaps we should do something about that. The students, um, as I said, the inconsistency of older versus younger staff using technology enhanced learning. And also, some of them complained about a lack of availability of specific technologies. Um, th these were mostly quite specialist technologies. And in the Far Eastern campuses, uh, technical problems were specifically mentioned. Um, they get more power outages than we do. So facilitators, obviously training. I, I'd love to say time as well, but I don't think that would happen. Um, and communication. The change agents need to communicate with the innovators and early adopters to start with, but don't leave it just there. Come back later to facilitate the early adopters spreading the, the word through their interpersonal networks. So you can expect the early adopters um, coming to learning technologist workshops but it would be nice if they could use workshops to spread the word amongst their colleagues about what they're doing. And the students are very um, savvy about whether staff have received training or not. Also, students like using technologies that are easy to use. They love OneNote, for instance. Okay, we, we've had various strengths and weaknesses of this studies. The mixed methods was great for the development of, of our survey. We probably wouldn't have asked the questions that we are asking if we just started with a survey. Um, we 
had real difficulty, though, recruiting enough participants for our focus groups. And uh, despite bribes of food, um, so they were very small focus groups, but there were a lot of them because of that. And also participants might have self-selected because they had an axe to grind, like we can't get this technology or we haven't got training or various complaints. And I thank you for listening and thank you to the Newcastle University Education Committee who, who funded the project. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, so we've got a couple of questions on uh, VVOX. So the first one is, what do you mean by the gap between learning technologists and teachers regarding training? I think when the person, well, a couple of people mentioned a gap between learning technologists and teachers, it wasn't um, so much knowledge of, they expected the learning technologists to have lots of knowledge but it's the gap between getting to see them and getting that knowledge put over to them. So providing time for training and opportunities to train. Is there anybody in the room who has a question? No? Okay, so we've got another one on uh, VVOX as well. Any ideas of mechanisms for promoting better communication between colleagues in the university? Um, we do have... Um, in the learning teaching development services, we do have web pages for best practice, so that can be put out. Um, we also have um, technology groups such as Newcastle Nutella. It's not chocolate spread. It's Newcastle University Technology Enhanced Learning Advocates, and, and they um, will train people and, and explain um, new technologies that are being rolled out. So there are mechanisms there, but like a lot of things that go on in the university, there's silo working, and I'm not sure how you can get around that on an institution-wide basis. Okay, we've got one here that relates to you mentioning rewards. Um, so it says institutions are so dependent on early adopters, how can we best reward them for being part of uh, the discourse? Oh, that's difficult. <laughs> um, it certainly should be part of, a, the, the teaching and scholarship should certainly be part of um, the pathway to promotion rewards. Um, I know the official line is that yes it is, but in some faculties it's more difficult than others. It should be consistent across the board. Okay, uh, we've got one here about uh, your continued plans. So are there plans to continue collecting feedback from staff and students in yeah. future years? Once, once uh, we've finished this study, we will use um, future feedback on, on blended learning that is developed by um, the, the new people in the university who are coming in to help us uh, develop the blended learning. Um, the student feedback on those courses, we will also gather staff feedback in the future to see how it's going. Okay, um, we've got one here about the extent to which blended learning's used at Newcastle. Um, you know, is it small groups or is it extensive? And would that, the extent to which that's being done impact the, the findings? Um, I think it, it, yes, I'm sure it will. Um, impact on our findings because they'll they'll be the ones that uh, fill out the questionnaire I would imagine um, but I think it is small groups there are not huge programs that are entirely blended we have programs that are entirely online but as far as I know um, there are not many programs if any that are entirely blended across the board Okay, uh, we've got one here about what strategies are best when it comes to engaging staff in staff development opportunities? Um, million dollar question. <laughs> um, I think I, I think a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, if you have staff 
talking to their colleagues that, hey, I went to this and it was really good and it was really useful. That will help a lot. Um, showcasing what people have done with the training they have received, that will help as well. Okay, and then we've got a final question here. Does the feedback influence choices of systems and improvements to them? Ah. Oh. I, I would imagine it will, but I'm not at that end of, of the, the, the uh, I don't choose the technologies, I'm not, not part of that, so, but I imagine the feedback will help that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Has anybody got any further questions in the audience? No? Okay, thank you very much, Alison, and I'd like to take a chance to just thank all of our speakers uh, for the session. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with multiple, our Jupyter Notebook servers. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.